I walk this path alone. Be with me now. Be with me now, Lord. Breath of heaven, hold me to.
kindness and your encouragement. We love you, the Bible says, because you first loved us. Thank you for the truth in these beautiful songs. Thank you for your word this evening. Thank you, Father, for each person who's here, anyone who may be viewing the service over the internet. Bless, Lord, edify, be honored, be glorified, strengthen our souls, reveal Christ to us. Teach us, Lord, give us spiritual wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, before we get into the message tonight, I asked someone Sunday morning, hey, do you know what the word Noel means? <laughs> Uh, it's a nice sounding word. I've been singing it my entire life. And uh, he said, no, I don't. I thought he would know. He was a very smart man. So we looked it up. How many know what Noel means? Okay. Well, we're all in grade school then together, I guess. Apparently, it's a French a derivative out of the French language. And it means an announcement of the birth of someone very, very important. And so whoever wrote this chose that word to speak of the most important birth that was ever uh, took place here on the earth. So um, ask some folks if they know what Noel means, okay? And then you can share that with them. It'll remind them about Jesus. Also, after the service, uh, there'll be some folks over here, some men, uh, women or whatnot, uh, here to pray and you guys that are praying for people you could even sit on the edge of the stage if you want so if you would like someone to pray for you you can come up and just uh, they'll ask you how can I pray for you and if you have a prayer whatever it is you want them to pray about please tell them now prayer as you know when it when we're praying according to the will of God what happens he what he hears us, doesn't he, when we pray according to his will. And then if we know he hears us, what does that mean? It means we know that we're going to receive 
the petition that we've desired of him because he has a will and he says, this is my will found in the word. And so when, when we identify what his word, is, what his will is, however it would apply in your life, then if we ask him, Lord, this is your will. I'm asking you to bring to me whatever the matter might be, uh, and he'll do that for you. So the other thing is we started last week, and this will become a regular ministry opportunity on Wednesday nights, just a, oh, 10 minutes or so after the service is over, uh, we're gonna have a small prayer meeting, however many come, this is just a number of people, but for 10, 15, 20 minutes, we're just gonna be praying, and it's directed prayer, meaning uh, one of us will bring up various issues to pray about, and so we can pray intelligently and pray specifically, and uh, so you're all invited. If you'd like to hang around afterwards, we'll just meet right up in this area here. With that said, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of the Gospel of John, chapter 17. John, chapter 17. And let's go ahead and stand, please. Uh, this is God's precious word, his living word that we have before us here this evening. John 17, beginning in verse 13. John 17, 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Well, Father, thank you for your son's prayer. Uh, we know that he is alive today at your right hand, that he's continually making intercession for us this evening. And Lord Jesus, we ask that since you know exactly who we are, you know exactly what help we need from you, what encouragement we might need, wisdom, whatever it might be, Lord Jesus, you are completely aware of it. And so we ask as you're interceding uh, for us that you would uh, bring those things to our Father. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, please be seated. This 17th chapter is, of course, the, it's called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus Christ. In fact, you really could call chapter 17 the Lord's Prayer because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who was praying. What we call the Lord's Prayer over in Matthew chapter 6 more rightly ought to be called the Disciple's Prayer. And if anybody is getting too cold, just let me know. Is it a little chilly in here tonight? A little chilly. Okay, I'm so sorry we can't do anything about it. I just, wanted, I just wanted to know if you were cold and my heart goes out to you. No, they're gonna adjust that, that right now. Thank you, thank you. Um, so Matthew chapter six, what we call the Lord's Prayer over there would more rightly be called uh, the Disciples Prayer because Jesus, uh, he told us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He would have never prayed any of those things in, in the uh, disciples' prayer, uh, but uh, at any rate, this is really the Lord's prayer. And you'll notice in verse 13, right at the beginning of that uh, verse, he says, but now, the, uh, what that means is he's changing what he had been praying for. If you study through chapter 17, you'll see there are different groups of ideas, purposes, people, things that he prayed for. So he's making a transition now from what he had been praying for to what he is going to pray for. By the way, I've entitled the message tonight, Why Jesus Prayed for You. 
why Jesus prayed for you. In fact, what started his prayer in chapter 17 actually begins in chapter 16, the very last verse, John 16, 33. He says in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you. And he's speaking here and in John 17, of course, to those who follow him. He references what he had been teaching in John 14, 15, and 16. These things I have spoken to you, and here was the purpose of what he had said to them. That in me, in Christ, in me, you may have peace. Now remember, back in chapter 13, towards the end of chapter 13, the disciples first became aware that Jesus was leaving them. They didn't quite understand everything that was going to happen, but they knew, in fact, he was going to leave them. That's why in chapter 14, he said these famous words, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? The next phrase was actually a command. You believe in God? You've got, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God? I want you to believe in me. And he began then to explain where he's going. He just told them, I'm going to be leaving. Now he tells them exactly where he's going, what he's going to be doing, uh, what he's going to do in the future. And he talks to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so he's comforting them all the way through chapter 16 to verse 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. He wanted his people, his disciples who were following him, he didn't want them to be distressed. God doesn't want you to be distressed tonight. He doesn't want me to be distressed. He says, in the world, you're living down here in the world, you will have tribulation. Straight out, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he was speaking to them to help them in the days that were coming. He was leaving. They were still going to be in the world. In fact, the word world is mentioned 19 times in this chapter. So you can see it's a, a huge uh, you know, theme through this chapter. And what the word world means here, it means the system that is governed by Satan that is opposed to God and Jesus Christ. He's not speaking of the material world. He's speaking of the system in the world where Satan is the God of this world. And Satan is opposed to God. He's opposed to Jesus Christ. We saw that in Genesis chapter three, coming and tempting Adam and Eve. We saw it in Matthew chapter four, when Jesus began his Uh, public ministry. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil who in fact tempted him. And Jesus as a man, God man, as a man, he actually overcame the temptations of the devil by the word of God in his own life. So as you get into chapter 17, he's now actually no longer speaking to them. He's turned and in earshot, he's praying to them. He said, how would you, know, would you know he was praying to them? Because the text actually uh, speaks of it. In fact, in John 17, 13, he says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world. I'm speaking these things. I've spoken these things to them. So he was praying. What was he praying for? Why did Jesus pray for them? Why would Je- what would Jesus pray for you about? Well, he was praying to give them the resources for their time here in the world. He's leaving. They're going to be here. He knows they need not only to be comforted in terms of where he's going, what he's doing, what's going to happen, but he actually is praying for them to have the resources needed to actually overcome the world. We looked at the first resource last week, which was his joy. He said that my joy might be fulfilled in them. And we 
uh, studied to see how joy is not a reference to some kind of a, a uh, you know, a highly emotional state or just some kind of a excited state or whatever, bubbly or anything. It really is more the idea of the Christian who in facing life and all that life brings, the, the challenges, the blessings and whatnot, but particularly the challenges. The joy of the Lord is that that believer who encounters tribulation challenges, rather than react in their own wisdom to the challenges, they turn to God. They trust God. They know, know who God is. And so they, they're not looking at God through their trials. They're looking at their trials through God. God is faithful. God is your father. God is omnipresent. He's all knowledgeable. He's all powerful. He's with you. He'll never leave you. And so when a person has that settled assurance in their mind because they have put their trust in God, they know that whatever happens is okay because God is working all things according to the counsel of his own will. Once a believer understands that and believes it and begins to apply it, you find great joy in your life. Everything is going to be okay. So tonight, two words to define the two main thoughts we're going to look at tonight. One is word. The other is the word help, word and then help. So to begin with, Jesus gives us or Jesus gives the word of God. Jesus gives the word of God. Look, he says it right here in chapter 17, verse 14. Speaking to his father, he says, I have given them, my disciples, your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You have the word world mentioned just three times in that verse. I have given them your word. And he's speaking of it in the past tense. I have given them your word. Now, twice in his prayer, he mentions the word of God. It's mentioned once in chapter 17, verse 8, if you want to look there quickly. It's also mentioned in chapter 17, verse 14. Now, since we're living in a deceived and a deceiving world, the possession of the truth of the word is absolutely essential. This world is deceived. This world is being deceived. We need God's word. Why is that? Because... It's not our word that will help us to overcome. It is God's word that overcomes the deceitfulness of the world. Remember, he said, I have overcome the world. And so you and I, in this dark, deceitful world, you and I need the word of God, which is true, because it overcomes the deceitfulness that we live with every day. Now, the material world, as we know, was created by God, right? In Genesis chapter 1, it says God attempted to create and didn't work, but no, it doesn't say that, does it? God created the world. He created everything. He spoke and it, it occurred. In fact, God would say, let there be, and there was. That's a summary of creation, all of it. Let there be, and everything that was created is a result of his uh, word. God spoke his word. We're talking now, remember, that Jesus gives the word, why the word is important. It's so powerful. In Psalm 33, verse 6, let me just read this to you. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. For he spoke and it was done. Imagine how powerful God's word is. He commanded it and it stood fast. So the same word, this is interesting, the same word 
that created the universe is sustaining the universe. In the book of Colossians, it uses a uh, Greek word that in English means cohesive. God created everything, but it's cohesive. It's being held together by his word. And when the heavens and the earth will be destroyed, all he needs to do is withdraw his word and everything will just scatter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, let me read this to you. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition or the destruction of ungodly men. Everything in, everything in the created world except man obeys the word of God. Think about it. Everything in the created world, he's controlling it all. Everything is in obedience to him except man. Man is a sinner. We've noted before, last week in fact, that Christians are in this physical world, but Christians are not of the world system that runs the world today. Society organized without God and against God. That would be a good definition of what we mean by the world system. Let me repeat that. Society organized against God and without God or without God and against him. So back to the believer, his citizenship is he heavenly. We've been born from above, and as a result of our new birth, our concerns are now for the spiritual. They're for the eternal. That concern, that interest, that hunger, that thirst you have for God and the things of God, you never had that before you were truly born again. And unbelievers who see somebody get uh, converted and transformed they can't figure out in fact they think you're crazy what happened to him what happened to her they don't want to party with us anymore they don't want to speak this way they've got religion they, they don't they literally don't understand it well you when you were a little baby naturally born into this world naturally you wanted your mother's milk you wanted food when you were born from above born a second time you now have new desires you have desires for the things that are spiritual and the things that are eternal. The unbeliever's citizenship is earthly. The unbeliever's concerns are for the physical and the material and the temporal. What happens is this. The lost sinner will look at spiritual things. They cannot understand them, and they just reject it. The believer looks at the things of the world, understands them too well, and rejects them. Turn with me to 1 John, please, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. 1 John, all the way over there near the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 2, and what we're saying is the difference between the lost sinner and the saved sinner is that the lost sinner looks at spiritual truth. They can't understand them, just like you couldn't understand the Word of God. You couldn't understand Christianity. You don't understand it, and, and you just reject it. But the believer looks at the things of the world and understands all too well, because you and I once were in the world, and we don't really want to have anything to do with it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus, or the, the, the apostle John says, Do not love the world, that system that's organized against God, is opposed to God. Do not love that world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, there's the lust of the flesh for passion, there's the lust of the eyes for possessions, and there's the pride of life for your own position in life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. You and I, we've been there. We used to love the world. We used to reject Christianity. We now love the Lord, and we don't, we don't want to get involved in the world. When we do, when we get deceived and tricked into it, and we fall, and we sin, uh, the, you can't, uh, the Christian, thing about a Christian, uh, when you were not a Christian, you could sin and really, really enjoy it. In fact, the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. After a while, it's not pleasurable. But when you're a Christian, sin isn't even pleasurable at all because you're a Christian. You have a new nature. So you have this conflict. The world hates the believer. Jesus said it. Now, there was a backwoods preacher. You know, backwoods preachers, uh, there's many frontwoods preachers that don't have good grammar, but he defined the status quo. He said, quote, it's the mess we is in. We're in this mess. That man knew what he was talking about. This is the mess we're in. The lusts of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, everybody racing to be this, do that, have this, experience this. You see, the world system rejects the word of God, and what it does is it substitutes for it the wisdom of men and the wisdom of the world. They, they, they reject God's word, so they have their own ideas. Really? You say, really? Yeah. You know, the world will tip its hat on special occasions to God, but it will never, it will never bow the knee on any occasion. You often hear pundits on television who often speak against Christianity, but then they may have a Christian minister on or some event has occurred, a tragic event, and they start talking about God and the truth, and they're respectful to this minister, but they just are tipping their hat. There's no real uh, anything, but they'll never, ever bow their knee to the Lord on any occasion. So consequently, we have the mess we're in. We have the mess that we're in. We have more laws than ever before, and yet we have more lawlessness. Think about what's happening with the homeless population. In San Francisco, you can now go into any store. Uh, you can shoplift, if you do, as long as you don't go over $728. If they catch you, it'll just be a misdemeanor. So imagine how much people are getting out of stores every day. The Silicon Valley, one of the most wealthy places in the world. They're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to have people go pick up human waste off of the sidewalks. We have all these laws, but we have more lawlessness. Injecting drugs right out in the open. Murdering babies. I mean, you just name it. More laws, yet more lawlessness, more knowledge, than, and yet less wisdom. You ever think about how they figured out how to land a vehicle on the moon and to do it and return safely? We have more wealth today. Stock market is at all-time highs, yet we have fewer real values we have more power in our own nation militarily and yet greater weakness. So Jesus gives the word. Also, number two, the word of God helps us to overcome. 
The word of God helps us to overcome. Come. Again, go back to John 16, please, verse 33. John 16, 33. Uh, by the way, I know that Pastor Michael Clark uh, is watching us tonight. So, hello, Pastor Michael Clark. Uh, they're up there in Tehachapi. Um, we're glad that you're, you're tuned in. I hope you are. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. Jesus is God, right? He's also what? Man. He is the God-man. He was fully God, except he left his, he, he hid, if you will, his glory. He looked just like any man. He looked like any man. In fact, the Bible says he wouldn't even stand out in a crowd. He just looked like an average man. And he was really a man. He would get tired. He would get thirsty. He would get hungry. He got angry in the temple a few times. He would pray. He would be tempted. And so the Bible tells us in Hebrews, actually, that Jesus was actually tempted in every way that you could be tempted. In, any, in every way that you could be tempted, Jesus was tempted, but... He didn't sin, did he? He said, I have overcome the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He never sinned. Now, if Jesus as a man, back in Matthew chapter 4, being attacked by the devil, as a man was able to withstand that attack, here he's saying, as a man, I have overcome the world. So you and I are human beings. Jesus is our example. If he can overcome the world, what does that say about you and I who are in him? He wouldn't have said, be of good cheer. Hey, you're going to have all kinds of pressure and trouble. You're going to be persecuted, but be of good cheer. You say, what? <laughs> be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. These things I'm speaking to them, so that in me they might have their joy fulfilled. The world hates them. The world hates me. I've given them your word, which is essential to overcoming the, the uh, world. The word overcome, by the way, excuse me, the word tribulation is not only speaking of persecution from the world, but trouble, inward distress. The inward distress. And you know, when you're distressed, the idea is you feel like you're falling apart. You're, you're ripping, ripped apart. The word overcome means, overcoming the world means so that the world system that is opposed to God will have no power over you. It's still there, but it'll have no power over you. The world will have the, the external uh, persecution that can come against you or the internal distress, the temptations and discouragements. Uh, you can overcome that, and we're going to look at that more closely a little later on. So here's a question. How exactly... Does the word of God help you and I to overcome the world? How does it work? You're actually holding it in your hand. That's the Bible. How does this Bible help you and I to not be in all of that in the world? Well, first of all, the word of God exposes the world as it really is. The word of God exposes the world as it really is. Do you remember Lot and Abram, Abraham? They 
nephew and uncle, Abraham and Lot, they were prospering their flock so much that they had to split up in order to survive. They had to make adjustments. So Abraham said, well, Lot, you can pick whatever place you want to go to, and I'll just let the Lord give me whatever is left over. Lot was impressed with a city called what? Sodom. And Abraham wasn't. You ever wondered, why was Abraham not, you know, because he said, Lot, you can take the best place you, there is. Lot said, I'll take Sodom. Abraham wasn't interested. I wonder why he wasn't interested. Well, if you'll turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 11, we have an answer. And if you just stay in Hebrews 11 a little bit, we're going to look at another verse as well. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. The reason Abraham wasn't impressed with Sodom is because Abraham had his eyes on a better city. Hebrews 11.10, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Just like you and I. What's Jesus building for each of us in heaven? He's got many mansions, isn't he? Doesn't he? He's building a place for us. Now, what would have happened if Lot had consulted Abraham, his uncle, who was wiser than him just by virtue, generally speaking, of his age and whatnot, what would have happened? Well, he could have avoided what happened to him in Sodom. What did happen to him in Sodom? Short version, he lost everything he had. He had to run for his life. But the, the, the world system was attractive to Lot. He moved in there. And as mentioned, he lost everything. Moses is another example of seeing the world exposed for what it really is. In Hebrews 11.26, speaking of Moses, it says, 11.26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. You remember uh, his mother and sister put him in that little little ark and little boat and put him in the river there, the Nile, and they watched, the, the daughter watched, and what happened was, whose daughter? Pharaoh's daughter saw the little baby, and she said, Who, you know, bring me that baby, and then um, it was either the daughter and Moses' mother said, oh, by the way, uh, you know, your highness, uh, we'll be glad to kind of take care of the child if you like while it's growing up, but the child is yours. And so Moses wound up growing up in what? The middle of the supreme leadership of the nation of Egypt. He could have been captivated by the prestige, the pleasures of Egypt, and he would never have left that palace and identified with the Jewish nation if he allowed himself to be captivated. But he saw Egypt as, he, as it really was and he didn't want it. Now it's sad to say that the people of Israel didn't share his vision and often wanted to go back to Egypt when things got tough. They were happy to be out of there they were happy when everything was going well, but as soon as it got tough, they said, you know what? We should go back because we had it easier back there. That's not true. Do you know what the Bible has nothing good to say about? The Bible has nothing good to say about the world system. All through the Bible, there's a contrast between Babylon or the world and the heavenly Mount Zion. Look with me, please, in John chapter 14 for a moment. Here's a number of things that the Bible says about the world, and none of them are good. In John chapter 14, verse 30, look what Jesus says. Satan is the prince or the ruler of this world. Jump over, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, over there to the right. And we're just going to continue to move through the Bible here, going to the right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. What it says here is that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. In verse 18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made, the fool made foolish the wisdom of this world? Look what's happening today in Washington with the uh, partisanship, uh, the current effort to impeach the president. Um, they're like children fighting and lying and just arguing all day long instead of working. It's terrible. You could go on and on and on, but look in verse uh, uh, 21 there. It says, for since, the wisdom, for, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, its wisdom, did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. What do you mean a man who's being executed can be your savior? But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, there's not a lot of super-duper wise people in the body of Christ. There's some here and there. You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen what is they call the foolish things of the world, which would be you and I, to put to shame the wise. Remember the story of the man whose uh, farm was producing so much he didn't have any more room to store everything in? Do you remember? He said, what am I going to do? He said, well, I know what I'll do. I'm going to build some extra silos and I'll put all my, the bigger harvest in there and then I'll It'll all be okay, I'll just eat and drink and be merry for the rest of my life. And then God says, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be? You're going to leave, all of this is going to be left behind. For the Christian who's storing up treasures in heaven, we look forward to the Lord saying, you're not foolish, you're my child and I'm bringing you home now. I've been reserving all of your treasures and your rewards in heaven. They'll be there when you get there. So quite a difference. So in verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. He did this so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. As it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let me just mention a few others. I'll just read them to you. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 31, it says the fashion of this world is passing away. It's just going to be gone. Let's turn to James 4. I, I do want to show you this. In James 4, uh, James brings out uh, some very, very important and helpful 
truths to us to help us understand how we should uh, conduct ourselves and what to do and what to watch out for. And while you're turning there, let me remind you, we've said the Bible has nothing good to say about the world. Number one, Satan is the prince of the world. Number two, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Number three, the fashion of this world is passing away. And number four, the friendship of the world is enmity or opposition to God. James chapter four, verse four. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, makes himself an enemy of God. Also, the love of the world robs us of the Father's love. In fact, the world itself is passing away. But the Christian, we're told in the book of James, who gets friendly with the world may find him or herself getting spotted by the world. Look in James chapter 1, please, verse 27. James chapter 1, verse 27. It's easy to become friendly with the world. You wind up getting spotted by it. It's like the little child who stole the cookies and had the crumbs on his lips, and mom said, hey, what happened? He said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, don't know what happened. <laughs> Verse 27, pure and undefiled religion, knowing God, walking with God. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Do you know a, a believer rarely just turns on a dime and plunges into the world? It doesn't happen that way. What happens is the believer gradually gets closer and closer and closer to the world and eventually they will fall. Friendship can lead to loving the world. When we become friends of the world, what happens is we soon get conformed to this world. Let me read Romans 12, 2 to you. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Haven't we all fallen into these things more than once a number of times in our life? Don't worry about how far back you can remember or how far you can count. We all know what it's like. You know, we're walking with the Lord. We're enjoying him. We enjoy loving him, serving him. We like the love of the brethren. We, you know, church and fellowship, it's just so wonderful. But then pretty soon we uh, stop reading our Bibles. We're not feeding our minds and our hearts every day, maybe every once in a while. And, and then pretty soon, you know, you were going to church regularly, but then you start going to church just once and a while, and then little by little, you really hardly are going. And you find yourself a friend of the world. You'd be happier sitting in a bar with people who are friends of the world. And so, don't love the world, John said. Because when we love the world, what happens is we become conformed to this world. And somebody sees you who knew you, and they can see you do not look like the Christian I knew. Haven't you seen people like that? Maybe you've been that person and a Christian has seen you. Usually when it's you that people are seeing, you don't want to see them, do you? It's hard to look people in the eye if you know something's wrong. That's why none of you are looking at me. No. Um, but uh, haven't you seen people who were vibrant Christians? And then they've just fallen. Now, we're not talking about somebody here. We're just talking about a Christian who 
just drifted. We're not talking about losing your salvation. We're just talking about Christians. We've all drifted like that. So what should be separation from the world actually turns into imitation. We're imitating the world. We're acting just like the world. And what is the result? Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. What is the result of what ought to be separation that turns into imitation? As you're turning to 1 Corinthians 11, 32, we're going to see that we are in danger of being condemned with the world and like Lot, losing everything. I've met many Christians like that. 1 Corinthians 11.32, when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So the Lord steps in and speaks to his child, his erring child, and brings him back. So God's word exposes to us the true nature of the world system. Secondly, how does God's word help us? God's word also spells out our personal relationship to that system. The word exposes it. It also reveals to us or spells out our personal relationship to that system. In John 17, 14, Jesus says, I have given them your word. Now remember, we're talking about what is our personal relationship to the system of the world. I have given them, my followers, your world, word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Do you know that a true believer will be hated by the world? The truer and more focused you become, the more the world will hate you. The reason is because you represent Jesus Christ. Look again in John 17, 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Didn't the world hate him? They sure did. Now, sad to say, a lot of Christians pick fights with the world and they become offensive to the world, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about being ignorant and whatnot and, and offending people. Look in John 15 with me for just a moment, please. John 15. In verse 18, in John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if you were still in the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And then in John 15, 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Do you know, it's a dangerous thing when the world loves and honors a Christian. It's a dangerous thing when the world honors and loves a Christian. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1 Corinthians 4, 9, Paul said, concerning himself and the other apostles, we are a spectacle to the world. The Greek word translated spectacle gives us our English word theater. The verb means to publicly expose and put to shame. We're a spectacle to the world. They might tip their hat to you, but that's not what they really think. The world laughs at us. They don't take us very seriously. Just the way spectators respond to entertainment in a theater. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 4.13 that he and the apostles were the scum of the world. That word means refuge, refuse, garbage, off-scouring. What do you do with garbage? Well, the wife says, husband, honey, you know what to do with it. Please take the garbage out. Throw it away. Why? Because it's of no value. 
So the world does not value the church. Remember, we're talking about our relationship to the world. The Bible helps us to understand what our personal relationship is. They hate Christians. The world doesn't value the church no matter how many speeches worldly people may make talking about God or talking about truth or, or saying, and may God bless America. That's not how they really feel. And here's something really, really important. The sooner the Christian believes what the Bible says about the world and his or her relationship to it, the sooner that Christian will start living in victory over the world. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 7, verse 1, that it is impossible for the world system and the Christian to get along with each other. That's why the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Can light and darkness have anything to do? No, they don't. The third thing that the word, the way the word helps us, not only does it expose what the world really is, not only does it spell out what the world, our relationship to this world is, the third thing that the word of God does to help us overcome is it gives us the self-motivation that we need to live in the world and yet not be of the world. The word of God is our spiritual food, isn't it? It is our drink. It is our light to guide us. It is our companion when people accuse us. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 23, Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. The word of God is our sword. And we're going to stop right here, okay? There's much more to say about this, but we'll leave that for next week. How's that? You're saying, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I mean, no, no, you understand what I'm saying. You know, we can get oversaturated with the word of God, right? Because I know when you're oversaturated because you're, you're looking at it. Yeah, amen, amen. Praise, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Is he still going? Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Why Jesus prayed for you. Isn't that interesting? He has that resource, those resources. So we'll pick it up there next week, and then we'll begin also to look at the third resource. And Well, I don't think we'll get to the fourth, but we'll, we'll make an, an attempt. I did want to remind you, if you would like someone to pray for you, you can just come right up here. And those people who are available to pray, would you guys please, guys and ladies, make your way up right now so you can just stand right up there or you can sit on the edge of the, the uh, platform here. And then a few minutes after the service is over, we'll, those of you who would like, you're welcome, you're invited. If you'd like to learn how to pray, it's a great opportunity to learn how to pray. I learned how to pray listening to people who prayed. And um, so God bless you guys, okay?